gathering experiences from people around the globe to create and share knowledge. This is Pioneer Knowledge Services. Welcome to another exciting episode of KM Lobby. Today we are focused on the sector of law, the business sector of law. We're going to talk about some deep level stuff, some high level stuff, and some impactful stuff and things that'll help you as you move forward in your KM operation. Knowledge management is what Pioneer Knowledge Services is all about. We're here as a 501c3 in the USA building knowledge management abilities in other nonprofits and educating the general public. So joining me today, I'm Edwin K. Morris. I'm the president of Pioneer Knowledge Services. I've got Monica Denise Perrin, who is a co-host and from England in a little town called London. And we've got Janetta Guelli, who is the executive producer, if you will, of KM Lobby. She gets her own parking space. She's got her own coffee mug. I, she's very, very influential in the world of executives. Uh, and she is based out of Italy. And joining us today, we've got Vichelle. Agna Hotri, Evan Shankman, and Ian Rodwell. Now, I'm going to go around the horn here and ask each one of you to give us a little intro of who you are, why are you there, and what's going on? My name is Vishal Agnihotri, as Edwin uh, introduced me. I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer at Hinchon Culbertson. I have been in knowledge management for the last 23 years, so it's the only career I have known, and I've seen the various um aspects of knowledge management from business research to knowledge technology implementation training change management adoption etc um, and then the evolution of knowledge management into um, process redesign and innovation um, and um, project management and so on and so forth i'm evan shankman i'm the chief knowledge and innovation officer at fisher phillips we're a, a large labor and employment law firm, about 500 attorneys, 36 offices in the U.S. Um, that exclusively provides um, advice and counsel to employment work, um, immigration benefits, and so on. So anything workplace related. Um, I've been in the KM space now for a little over 10 years. And before that, I practiced law for about 10 years. I've been at Fisher Phillips for the past two years. So I'm Ian Rodwell. I'm head of client knowledge and learning at uh, Linklaters. Linklaters is a global law firm. We have around two and a half thousand lawyers in a number of, uh, a number of offices around the world. Um, I started there almost 30 years ago, um, setting up a know-how system, a knowledge system in our real estate department. What I do mostly now is, is um, uh, workshops, masterclasses, training sessions on everything from leadership, high-performing teams, creativity, all stops in between. And I'm also doing a very part-time doc some doctoral research uh, into storytelling in organizations. Monica, would you like to start off, please, with our first volley of questioning? As we've got these changing times now... Um... We've spoken about storytelling. We we know we we know that um, knowledge sharing happens with you know with a lot of serendipity. But how are we now in today's post-COVID world creating more formal um, knowledge sharing opportunities that don't happen in those water coolers? If there was any hesitation or um, uh, yeah, sort of misconception of what knowledge management uh, was or could be or the potential of it, it has been clarified largely because of all of us working remotely. Um, there was a lot of knowledge gathering, if you will, in an informal way by walking the halls, as you know. Um, we don't have that uh, now. Of course, we have technology. We can speak over calls and Zoom and uh, such. Um, but what it has brought to light is um, the um, the unnecessary effort that it takes to gather those bits and bobs to uh, put the piece together um, uh, that you'd like to present back to the client. So um, knowledge management has always been about connecting the dots, making sure the right information surfaces up at the right time in the right hands. And um, technology helps with that, process helps with that, um, training helps with that, so on and so forth. Um, but what that has pushed, I think it's been a catalyst uh, during these months um, to just awake to the possibility and almost now the necessity for having yeah. it. But the point is whatever the next uh, face of business will look like in hybrid mode, we know that um, 
tools and technology will help us just stay more synced up, more connected. So um, whatever pieces were serendipitous earlier, I think even those are getting pushed into a more formal space. Um, outside of that, there always has been a formality to knowledge management. Um, attempts have been made well, how far do we want to go back? But in corporate America, attempts have been made in a formal way, uh, in a disciplined way, for at least the last 25 years when McKinsey came out with the concept <laughs> of knowledge management and Bain and BCG and the other yep. strategy houses were... KPMG. The, KPMG, you know, Accenture, yes. Oh, and they, <laughs> exactly, Arthur Anderson, then Accenture. Um, um, they all realize that if um, they're selling knowledge for a living, they need to capture, harvest some of it mm -hmm. back as well, uh, whether it's in the form of formal methodologies, checklists, uh, what have you. Uh, and it's no different than law firms either. Law firms, um, we, we sell our knowledge, uh, our experiential learning um, to our clients, right? That's what they value. Uh, that's what we bring to the table. One of the things that really struck me, I think, about practicing attorneys and, and KM folks during the pandemic was, you know, the serendipitous, um, I'm just sort of gonna sort of be an, an expert uh, and I'm an attorney and I can do things on my own. I don't need to, to knowledge share. Um, that doesn't work anymore uh, in this world because especially in the labor, labor and employment space, um, there are, if you have a multi-state employer, there are so many issues that have sprung up due to COVID-19. Um, there are different laws in the states and counties for, who can wear masks, who has to wear masks, when they can, when they can't. There is really no way that any one individual can get up to speed on those. And the laws kept changing. We would get updates when um, the CDC would issue new guidelines and then the states would try to follow and employers would try to follow. Um, there really was a need for what I consider not the, the sexy, exciting data analytics and AI and cool KM stuff that people would love to focus on, but just classic KM, right? This was sort of the heyday 20 years later for exemplars, templates, forms that our employers really needed to have the gold standard remote work policy, the gold standard masks in the workplace policy, um, the gold standard form that you use to log temperatures of employees and things like that, because our employers, uh, our employer clients needed that information and our attorneys needed to be able to get it to them very, very quickly. And at times um, a half an hour after the CDC issued a new guidance or OSHA, our Occupational Health and Safety Administration issued new guidance. We needed to have something ready to go that the firm could stand behind and say, this is you know, top draw, uh, fantastic quality, accurate, up-to-date stuff. So um, just coming up with a system for the entire firm to really put down everything and collaborate on best practice, gold standard, uh, continually updating model forms, templates, and samples um, were something that, that really mattered um, in 2020, 2021, in ways that it probably wasn't as important for the 10 years before that. Precedents and exemplars and templates, they were sort of something that everyone considered was, you know, it's KM stuff, but then it wasn't the cool thing people talked about anymore. Um, but it became just mission critical for law firms last year and this year. Um, I don't think it's going away. Um, there now is a, a reinvigorated need um, and desire to have people in the firm collaborate and contribute those model documents, exemplars, templates, forms, give them away to clients for free, put them on your website, get eyes on your website, um, help the general public. All of that stuff um, was just put into hyperdrive after years of dormancy because everyone needed to have compliant forms, compliant documents um, at the ready within 10 seconds notice um, and know that it was good and not just something you could find on your DMS from 12 years ago and you presume it's good. One of the things that was always coming up from people who I never thought this would be a, you know, it would matter to would say, it's, the, it's that random encounter in the corridor. It's the, the casual collision, the serendipitous moment. And I hadn't realized how much information I get from this, apart and you know, also adding in you know, the social connection that those encounters serve, but the opportunity to swap ideas, to sort through problems, to get things off my chest, just to, just, just to kind of be innovative and, and do stuff. Um, and this was a constant theme. And we, we all kind of realized we couldn't really be serendipitous through this. You know, we are all here because an invite has been sent out. You know, this has been an intentional meeting. It wasn't just a casual encounter um, somewhere on the, on the internet. So I think what we do is a blend of, you know, that more formal stuff, the explicit side of KM, and then what I call the more social side of KM and where we can get those to blend, um, good things happen. And I think 
what's happened over the last year has demonstrated the value of both of those things. Ian, I, before we hand off to Janetta for the next question, I want to I wanna bring this point up based on what you just said and what previous uh, guests have said around that. The serendipity thing, I understand totally that the value of that towards innovation and knowledge sharing in a free form, free range kind of way is an absolute must. But the to me, there's a little bit of faulty logic there that it's only going on at the physical space and not the digital space. Do we have to just say it only happens in the physical space? Is there a re-education or reframing that needs to have happen? And maybe, maybe the last two years or so has been that reframe to where people will now open their minds up to different ways to connect. I, th I think that probably conflates two things. I think it conflates, you know, serendipity, which is about randomness and a culture of being open and communication. Um, and I think I think you're I think you're quite right. I think the you know one of the things that we've always sort of you know when I've worked with kind of clients or others and they've talked about the knowledge systems that they're looking to implement and I said well that, that's great. Um, but what is the culture behind that? Is there going to be a culture where people are going to be open and you know open in sharing what they know? Um, and then is there going to be a culture where people are going to use the systems that you've developed? Because over the years. I've seen a number of initiatives where technology has been fantastic, effort, but nobody uses them um, because there's not that culture there. So I think, yeah, I think that's a big part. You know, what's that, what's that phrase? You know, culture, Trump strategy all, every time. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's true. Yeah, um, it if is. you haven't got a culture, it ain't going to work. But I think the serendipity is maybe a facet of that. All right. Excellent. Janetta, thank you for that answer, Ian. Janetta, you're up. Let's make an example. So based on my knowledge and my experience, uh, um, in Italy and Malta, knowledge management is really unknown, and especially in the law and the law firms. And I don't know if this is a, from a cultural perspective or there is a something else. So how would you convince some law firm partners outside, you say, US and UK to invest in knowledge management? And from which point? And where did the start? Where should it start? in implementing knowledge management? How would you convince them? When I joined KM 10 years ago, or 11 years ago at this point, um, no one at my firm knew what KM was or, um, or why I would go into this unknown profession. Um, lot, you know, my parents never heard of it. Um, peers in law firms saying, are you doing like tech stuff? What are you doing? Um, so no one got it here. And it really has been over the past 10 years, I would say, that KM really went mainstream in the US. So. All of the same things that you're talking about needing to convince attorneys in, in Malta or Italy or wherever else, um, we're not that far removed from it in the U.S. And, and to the extent that you're holding the U.S. in, in the you know, legal KM world as you know, a seasoned veteran, it's really only been, you know, there are some firms that were in the KM space 15, 20 years ago, but very, very few of them. I wanted to preface this all by saying, don't feel like you're so far behind that it's not even worth starting if you haven't gotten it yet because... Um, everyone's far, far uh, um, long after the UK and England and, and so on in the KM space. Um, America is still re relatively junior in it as well. Uh, it's only been you know, 10, 12, 15 years or so. I, I, think, I think the UK um, has been the leader in this space. Um, they started it. Um, the, you know, the, is it the Golden Four? What, what do they call the, those firms? Um, Magic Circle. The Magic Circle, exactly. Yeah. So magic those firms circle. started it. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Great. It, it sounds, it sounds very impressive. Um, sounds like David Blaine. <laughs> right. It, they're, they're, you know, the seniors. Um, I think at this point now, um, there are law firms in the U.S. that would probably be juniors, uh, maybe sophomores, uh, because they really have come a long way. Um, so uh, so th that being said, convincing, um, when I started in my role, I was the first KM person at my other firm. Um, who's now been doing KM for 11 years. Um, and it really was all about getting quick wins. Um, you need to get quick wins to the attorneys. Um, there are some fantastic three, four, five year projects uh, in the KM world, you know, these more advanced data analytics projects, some AI projects, amazing stuff you could do with machine learning. All of that's terrific. But if you're trying to convince um, a law firm in a country that doesn't recognize what KM is yet and what the value is to legal, by saying I have this great five year project, it won't work. Um, you need to be able to come in and explain how very quickly within three months, you'll be able to roll out, you know, client facing extranets that will be a fantastic way to exchange information with clients. And that's something clients have been asking for. We can provide that, um, you know, whatever the issue might be, um, there are 
tech solutions that are out there now that are so far beyond the tech solutions that were around two, three years ago, um, that KM practitioners, innovation folks could come and roll those out in two, three months, four or five months. Um, very simple things could make a huge difference. There are so many low hanging fruit in law firms nowadays that I think you need to go in um, and pick a couple of low hanging fruit and show how quickly you could make a very meaningful difference. Things that will not be just shelfware where you get them to purchase something and no one uses it. Things that will assist them in their day-to-day -day workflow that they will love, the attorneys will love. They will not know how they practice without it. Um, and then in the background, you could be working on these bigger, more exciting projects that will get a lot of buzz, will be something no other firm has done, but that's not what you could do when you're trying to convince them that Cam is right for their firm. I think Evan's point is absolutely key. If you're looking to do this, you've got to, you've got to get those hearts and minds as to why you're doing it. And I always think the easiest thing is, if, you, if we do this stuff, it will make your life easier because that's the most attractive sell in the world. Will it make my life easier? Um, you know, beyond that, it's going to increase effectiveness. It's going to increase efficiency. It's going to reduce risk. But above all, what's really going to matter to me, it's going to make my life easier. I don't have to spend hours trying to work out things from first principles, trying to find a template agreement, trying to find out what is our good practice around this. What are the hot topics in my particular, particular sector? Because it's there. Somebody else has done it, has done it before. And I think the danger is, you know, when I've worked with kind of groups who are introducing a kind of a knowledge management strategy, um, that's the bit they forget. They get all excited about what they're going to do um, and some of the technology, um, but then they forget, hmm, why are we actually doing this? Um, because that's what you've got to sell to people. Um, and if you can get people behind it, if you can get the champions, and so that's really important. If you call them champions, knowledge agents, whatever, um, get them on board. And they, you know, they can be the, the people that diffuse this through the, through the organization. Um, Ian, Ian, I have to ask, on this cultural sector piece of hmm. adoption of KM, right? Uh, in cultural meaning regional or country or ethnicity, hmm. right? Um, so I hear what you're saying. You've got a backbone hmm. of IT that builds hmm. the way things will happen, hmm. right? Hmm. And for those folks to come on board, you're already there. You've, you've got hmm. a system in place that, that, that leads the behaviors, right? Hmm. But part of your gig is learning, right? Hmm. So how do you, how do you suggest a, uh, pre-K, uh, first grade level, uh, innovative somebody that's trying to push that. How do you introduce the concept in a learning behavior for people to start? So it's not a hard sell is what I'm getting to. I've got people to just think about, so what, what sort of knowledge do you need to do your job um, or you use in your organization? So with a law firm, it might be, well, there's kind of knowledge about the law, but also we, we've got knowledge about our clients as well. Oh, and we've also got the knowledge relating to how you might structure a transaction. So it's kind of project management knowledge. Or if we open a new office, there's a whole load of knowledge associated with that. Or recruitment. Um, or if you step into a leadership position, what's the knowledge? So you start to kind of to break it down and think, goodness, there's a whole load of knowledge that we're using. But then you say, so what is the most critical knowledge? What is the knowledge? So I think you interviewed Paul Corney, and I learned this from Paul Corney. And he said, you know, what is the, you know, if somebody, lead, you know, what is the knowledge that you can't replace, you can't replicate, that is in somebody's head and they walk out of the door and bang, it's gone. Um, and then people start thinking, oh yeah, okay, that, that's the critical knowledge. And then you say, well, okay, how can you make sure you get the critical knowledge to the people that can do something with it? Um, because knowledge is no good if it just sits in a, in a database and nobody uses it. It has no value whatsoever. So how do you get it to somebody who can produce something, you know, that valuable from it? So I think Ian, you try and break it down. Sorry, Ian, um, have, you changed, have you seen enablers, learning enablers changing um, over the no, last No, I haven't. Year? No. So people still need space. People still need rewards. They still need the recognition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe the storytelling aspect, though, Ian, you were saying you were doing a doctoral thesis mm. in it. I think that aspect has become a little bit more acceptable in business psyche, whereas it mm. might have been that's how we start to learn uh, when we're kind of blank slates, mm. if you will. Um, so I, just, I, I think that is an aspect that is more uh, that's taking on more hold. Um, I also think it's important because the, the business world today is so complex that we operate at the intersections of business, law, technology. We don't have the luxury of being disciplined in only one dimension. Um, you still 
need expertise, um, obviously, and the best of the best uh, lawyers, any professional, what they're sold will be really good. Um, you know, you talk about T-shape, Delta shape, all of that stuff, but they'll be really good at their craft. But there's such a huge need for that intersection as well, where the top of the T <laughs> touches the bottom of the T um, for, uh, for a range of various other skills and other sort of broader um, knowledge bases. In terms of convincing lawyers um, that they need this, one of the things that I do in my role um, is to assist our firm's attorneys in responding to pitches for um, to try to get you know, our law firm to represent a client in either all of their litigation matters across the country or a particular ind uh, individual litigation matter or counseling, whatever the case may be. Um, and in looking at hundreds of proposals for our work that our firm has to respond to, um, over the past year, about 75% of those proposals explicitly asked, and this is you know, employers trying to get lawyers to represent them, explicitly asked, how do you use data analytics to make better decisions? How do you uh, tell us about your knowledge management? How do you innovate to make the practice of law more efficient? How do you collaborate amongst your peers using technology? All of those questions um, are relatively new, past two, three, four years, we've started seeing those questions. But if you have a group of, of naysay or attorneys thinking, I don't need to worry about this. This isn't for me. They do need to worry about it. It is for them. Their clients and their prospects are asking for it. Um, and if their clients and prospects are explicitly asking um, our law firm and others how we are using KM, how we're using technology, how are we innovating, we need to have really good answers uh, to those questions and not just answers, but systems in place to, to have some meat behind those answers in order to start to win business in today's day and age. Let's go around the horn with burning questions. Monica, would you like to go first? Do you have yours ready? I, I do have a question actually. I'm, I, I think it might be on the back of what Evan was talking about and Michelle earlier on, which is uh, what are the kind of top health indicators uh, and KPIs that you guys are, are looking at and using at the moment? To determine the success of our knowledge management program. Yeah, and also to be able to course correct Yeah, uh, when things need to be, um, things aren't working as well as they could be. Yeah. Um, so this is a difficult question. I will preface it with that and I'll let uh, Evan and Ian uh, chime in as well. Um, I think it's a difficult question because there is a portion of it that's quantifiable and then there's a very large portion of it that is anecdotal, it just is. Um, knowledge management is experiential, um, therefore hard to um, capture and put a tag on. But because it's experiential, there are some things you can count, whatever you can count. You can count clicks, you can count click throughs, you can see how many times documents were opened, if there was an exemplar library, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can see how many times people are using it. If you've uh, deployed a search engine, you can see how people are using it, how effectively they're using it. Anything that's electronic that can be visited and tracked, of course, can be counted. Same goes for research databases which you can then um, add up and see, is this worth the money we're paying for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other half, um, and I don't know if it's in half and half, but uh, definitely the other side of uh, the KPI is what people um, feel they know or don't know, or how long they have to struggle to find something to, um, to have an answer. Um, so there are tools we've put into place where if you need to have an answer to a question, um, can you ask it in a more informal way as opposed to just email? So it's not just one-on-one, -on -one, it's not a phone culture. Uh, we do live in the 21st century. There are tools out there that can capture threads and that are searchable. Um, that um, we can't necessarily count every time the question was asked because a lot of times it will be by serendipity that somebody else will read it or it will be by um, uh, um, a, a comment by a senior partner and that junior associates who may otherwise have not been part of the conversation can can see because the conversation has been captured in a public thread, et cetera. Apart yeah. from your clicks and your, you know, how many, how many documents and you know, how many people are, are viewing them and how many do you actually have in the system? But it's actually, what is their return on engagement? I mean, it, you kind of, after 10,000 documents, 20,000 makes no, you can't keep counting yeah. uh, documentation or, you know, your assets. You have to start counting that, that return on engagement. Um, and I was wondering whether that, you know, how different ways um, that we did that. 
Yeah. And I wonder if another measure as well is, is for the kind of the health of the system is the amount of improvement that comes out of it. So if somebody uses mm -hmm. a document and then says, yeah. yeah, that was great. But what I think we could do to make it even better is X, Y, and Z. You know, to what extent does that happen? Um, so is there that, that culture? So in innovation, how, how, yeah, yeah. How, do you, how do you measure innovation? Where's, where's the checklist for that? Good question, Edward. Would you like to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> it's up here. <laughs> it's up here. Uh, so the innovation is always, a, an, a, I think, a, a tied at the hip aspiration to knowledge management because you want to mm. improve. You want to mm. become, going back to your original thought, Ian, about just make it easier for somebody. Mm. Why do I care? Because it's going to make your life easier. Uh, mm. Innovation feeds that easier, continually, mm. hopefully. Mm. Uh, so... I think innovation is definitely a key indicator, but how do you measure it? Uh, I'm uh, Evan. Yes, I see your hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Evan. Sure. So, no, I'll I'll, I'll point out um, first that Ian and Vishal's um, you know, everything they said I agree with. Um, internal metrics are important uh, where they exist. Um, number of searches made, number of times that um, a brief was drafted using that AI workflow, and you know all of that stuff. It's helpful. Um, I'll touch upon something just because um, this is one area that, that they didn't mention fully um, that I think it also is important is to look from an external perspective, because again, we're not a, a nonprofit. We do need to get clients. Um, we do need to keep clients happy. We do want to try to continue to bring um, additional um, potential clients to our firm. So from an external perspective, um, visibility is another uh, KPI, right? It's making sure that the world knows that your firm is doing everything it can to um, to be better, um, to come up with better answers, to come up with answers more quickly that are at a higher quality, to do things more efficiently. Um, and some of the things that, um, that we were able to do, you know, very fortunately last year, got a lot of visibility for our firm. Um, you know, something that took our mm -hmm. firm um, probably a week to put together. We put together a COVID-19 litigation tracker on our website that tracked every labor and employment case um, in the COVID-19, uh, that touched upon COVID-19 issues. Uh, we put it on our website. Uh, we were the first firm to do it for labor and employment. Um, and it very quickly you know, went viral to the point that um, it was back in, I guess, March when we rolled it out or thereabouts um, to today. It still is the number one hit on Google if you Google COVID-19 employment litigation. So getting external visibility in ways that can be tracked um, is just as important from my perspective to the internal metrics. It still will be a combination of, of anecdotal and hard objective facts, but um, when we have attorneys from our firm saying, I got another new client because they came to the website and reached out to me because I was our attorney in this office or, um, you know, KM initiatives and projects um, really help sell the department in that respect. Yes, we have been talking about knowledge sharing and during this pandemic, uh, it seems that lawyers or professionals have shared much more because they needed them because they miss it that the the one to one meeting in the corridor or in the office. But how about compliance? How about the keeping confidential information that especially in the law sector is important to pick secret? I tell you because when I work at the law, I mean, in a law firm, uh, I had the compliance manager always back to me and say, be careful, we are a law firm and we need to respect the law. So, hallelujah for knowledge sharing, but let's not break any law. So, how do you deal now that people are more willing to share knowledge, but Sometimes you have to say no. How do you say no? Why? I mean, the reason why, how do you explain it? Yes, share, but. So this is a dilemma. How would you approach this in your organization, in your law firm? I will say this, uh, you're correct. In terms of knowledge management is easier if it's public information or if it is not sensitive information. Um, it is um, also useful when it is client-related information. If it is, um, it, by nature, it's all client confidential. Um, so we do have an obligation to protect it. Um, so when we talk about knowledge management, um, actually even the tools where we uh, roll out to, um, to search, to, um, um, to share like in social uh, enterprise networks, et cetera, we do have rules of the road that people have to engage in. Um, for search engines, we protect, we have ethical walls for anything that is um, explicitly mentioned to be um, seen by very few eyes. Um, 
for everything else that is sociable, and I'll, I'll talk about social engines because I think that's where it starts to get a little tricky. And um, in knowledge management, where um, knowledge managers have tried to deploy search engines while keeping, uh, uh, while being respectful of making sure that the client information is not shared or it shouldn't be shared, um, it has to be accompanied with a lot of training uh, and wherever ethical walls um, need to be uh, deployed, they should be. Um, Evan and I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't wanna speak on Evan's behalf, but I think we're both, um, nat- we work for national firms. So mercifully, we're not, um, I will say at least yet held to the same privacy standards as say, firms in the EU probably are. Um, it doesn't help that every, country in the EU is a separate country. uh, And so they probably have their own local jurisdictions as well. Um, Having said that, GDPR is global and US firms are also obligated to respect uh, as long as we're talking about EU subjects. If we're not talking about EU subjects, then we are subject to whatever local laws. We don't have a federal law still in terms of privacy, if this conversation is going in that direction. We have one in California, CCPA. We have other jurisdictions that are coming up, Virginia, et cetera. Um, so in terms of being mindful of privacy from that angle, um, there is um, there is a growing understanding, but we're not as mature or um, in the same place where um, a lot of the EU firms are um, or EU countries are. Um, in terms of just being respectful of client confidentiality and disclosure, I will say this, I think the lawyers in the US are held to a professional code of conduct that is inherently understood that there is information that's confidential, there's privilege, there are rules um, around that, that everybody's and code of conduct that everybody's very well aware of. The other thing that I would add is um, we in KM don't necessarily have to be the end all be all experts in this area. What we need to do is partner with our peers in IT. Typically at law firms um, and probably in other organizations, the IT folks are the ones that are wading through the security and privacy concerns um, much more than other departments are. And from my perspective, being becoming best friends with your peers in IT um, will be the easiest way to ensure that you're compliant in all of your tools and all of your systems mm-hmm. and all of your databases and your portals and everything um, are up to up to all of the codes that you have to, to be up to, um, whether they are legally required for jurisdiction or best practices or just things that your clients want because your clients are financial institutions or whatever, and you need to meet certain standards. Working with IT to get there and using leaning on them for their expertise in this space um, will get you much faster to the, uh, to the proper answer and uh, making sure that you're in compliance than if a KM person tried to muddle through it on his or her own. As knowledge management professionals and working in the sector you work in of law, where is the future of knowledge management going? Predictive data analytics is, is you know, the oil. Um, it's really where I think a lot of, of um, legal practitioners will be going. Um, and KM takes on those projects, those initiatives to, uh, at most law firms. Um, we're looking to be able to figure out based upon all of the variables, we've handled hundreds of thousands of cases, right? Or you know, millions of cases if you take other law firms um, and, and put them all together. Um, and there are so many things uh, that you can take out of that if you can somehow structure that data or analyze unstructured data and make predictions from it as to how long will this case last? How much money will it take to get from this stage to that stage? If it's a case um, by uh, a gentleman who's 62 years of age, who lives in this county, who works in this job, who's asserting these claims, um, you can really make some predictions if you have all the data points there and then can run the analyses. You know, something you mentioned about augmented reality, et cetera, I think courtroom technology, you know, because you mentioned law in general, like where's, uh, you know, what's happening uh, with knowledge management and law. This is maybe not true, true knowledge management in the true sense of it, but anything that's still very mechanical has the potential for becoming digitized. So whether it is someone showing their exhibits, so instead of doing still video or you know foam board printouts or whatever it is, um, being able to bring uh, more advanced technology, which seemed like science fiction and Mission Impossible movies, um, 
bringing more of that. Um, we know during COVID, uh, there was definitely a leap uh, from virtual, uh, I'm sorry, from in-person hearings to virtual, which meant virtual depositions, virtual um, um, uh, sort of, you know, um, exhibit sharing, so on and so forth. So I would say that's something um, that is probably around the bend. Um, other things that are mechanical um, and probably in place for good reason, um, and in place because of a lot of other uh, issues might change, um, right down from, you said stenography uh, at the start of the conversation, right? So just court reporting is still done in the same way it, it has been done for many, many years. Um, there are tools obviously for light transcription, et cetera. It can be debated, well, wait a minute, then we can't stop it the way we do a, a life person and so on and so forth. So there's still kinks to be worked out, but technologies exist. And I think courtroom technology is also something very interesting. And that'll come back to the lawyers, right? Because they're the ones who will be actually using, interacting or dealing with um, any kind of change uh, on that front. There is such a great need to be able to pull information, even from the information that exists. So a lot of the advances that have been made right now in data visualization, Evan mentioned a couple of tools, but you know, I can talk about Lex Machina and other tools where they've used the power of analytics on public data. They've not generated the data. They've essentially just um, honed the, the search engines and the filters, et cetera, to extract more data that can be, that can give you that one extra edge, that one extra uh, value that you wouldn't, uh, not just wouldn't, it would take you days to compile and synthesize through. And through the power of data visualization, Ravel View, et cetera, you can do so much more um, in such less time. So that is the power that's gonna um, be, become more mainstream. I, I still think it's not mainstream, it's there but it's not mainstream yet. So I would say that's coming too. What do you see as the trend overall? Where are we? If you had to say, um, if you had to grade, let's go back to the kids in school. Are we at an F? Are we at an F minus? Are we at a C plus? And I mean that not just in your business sector, but if you had to generalize law in its entirety across the continental US or at least the US for, for just for, conversation where would you put us yes i, I would say um, not my firm in particular but all firms across the country i'd say pre-pandemic c post-pandemic or during pandemic uh, you know, at this point now uh, hopefully it'll be post-pandemic soon um a b you're actually asking for great, I, uh, like, like actual great. Great. <laughs> great it. Um, I, I think I'm just a tough grader then. <laughs> I would say we've got red pencil. The red pencil C is out. C minus to C plus or whatever. Um, I think there's still there's still a long ways to go. I think there's still a long ways to go. So you're in the C area. A yes, still. Okay. <laughs> that means there. That means there are a lot of opportunities. A lot of yeah. opportunities. You're right. Yes, and that's the exact way to look at it. I agree. Thanks for watching. If you want to hear more of our podcasts, check us out on Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Like and subscribe for more content and comment what you'd like to hear us talk about next.